We know that aldehydes can be oxidized easily to their carboxylic acids. Even mild oxidizing agents like PCC, Tollens reagent, Felling's reagent can also be employed for this purpose in addition to the myriad of other oxidizing agents that you know like acidic potassium permanganate, chromic acid, nitric acid and so on. But ketones in general are highly resistant towards oxidation. They need harsh and rigorous reaction conditions like elevated temperatures and use of strong oxidizing agents for reaction to take place or for the oxidation to take place. And even then we end up with a mixture of carboxylic acids as we can see here. But you know what, we can convert a certain type of ketones to their carboxylic acids without much hassle. And interestingly, this reaction can also serve as a distinguishing test to identify this type of ketones. And the special type of ketones that I'm talking about is the methyl ketones. And the reaction that I'm talking about which converts the methyl ketones to their respective carboxylic acids is the haloform reaction. So basically in this haloform reaction, aldehydes and ketones that have at least one methyl group attached to the carbonyl carbon atom, basically those compounds that have a COCH3 group are oxidized by halogens in the presence of a strong base to form sodium salt of corresponding carboxylic acid and haloform. On acidic workup, we get the corresponding carboxylic acid here, correct? Now remember, the reagents are taken in excess in this reaction. Now if you look at this reaction, you will also notice that the product has one carbon atom less than the starting reactant. You see, the RCO group of the methyl ketone is retained in the product, but the CH3 group gets transformed to haloform here. And that is why this reaction also becomes important when we talk about conversion reactions where we need a product or a carboxylic acid that has one carbon atom less than the starting reactant. But we can get to that part later. In fact, iodoform test which is a type of haloform reaction uses iodine as a halogen and this particular iodoform test can be used to physically distinguish methyl ketones from other compounds. For example, Let's take two carbonyl compounds, one that has a COCH3 group and one that does not. Let's say acetophenone and propanol. So acetophenone has a COCH3 group and propanol as you can see here does not have any COCH3 group. Now when we take these two in two different test tubes and add the same reagents which is iodine in the presence of a base like NaOH, you will see that a smelly yellow precipitate of iodoform is formed in the former case that is in the test tube where we added acetophenone whereas no such reaction takes place in the latter case or the test tube that contains propanol. This formation of the yellow precipitate confirms the oxidation of acetophenone to corresponding benzoate ion. So clearly you can see how the simple test can be a powerful method to distinguish methyl ketones from other compounds. Now for you students it is especially important to understand haloform reactions because it is an important part of the carbonyl chemistry. It is essential that we understand the actual chemistry of this reaction by looking at this mechanism and see what is special about these methyl ketones that it undergoes this reaction easily giving us a carboxylic acid when in general ketones are highly resistant towards oxidation. So let's now take a look at the mechanism of haloform reaction. So the first step in this reaction is the formation of the enolate ion. You see, methyl ketones have acidic alpha hydrogens which can be taken up by a base. Now why are the alpha hydrogens in carbonyl compounds like methyl ketones acidic? Well that is because of the electron withdrawing nature of the CO group. You see, oxygen being electronegative draws the electron density of this bond towards itself. And this gives oxygen a partial negative charge and the carbonyl carbon a partial positive charge. Now because this carbon is now electron deficient, so as a result what it does is it would draw electron density from the adjacent carbon atoms which is the alpha carbon atom here and as a result of that it makes these CH bonds weak and when this CH bond becomes weaker it becomes easier to break this bond and release H plus ions. So we know that any compound that releases an H plus ion is acidic, right? So the more ease with which an H plus ion can be released, more acidic the compound is. And this is why the alpha hydrogen atoms in carbonyl compounds are acidic. And as a result, a hydroxide ion can easily abstract this and form the corresponding enolate ion. Now a major driving force for this reaction is also the stability of the product. 
You see, the enolate ion that we get here or the conjugate base formed is highly resonance stabilized and this is what drives the reaction in the forward direction. Now this enolate ion is also nucleophilic in nature. You see the carbon atom has a negative charge. Carbon atom is not like the electronegative oxygen atom which would be comfortable holding on to a negative charge, right? So which means it is in hurry to get rid of this negative charge. And in its attempt to get rid of the negative charge, enolate ion becomes a very good nucleophile. And what do we have in a reaction mixture? Of course we have the base, but we also have our halogens and halogens are electrophilic. So this nucleophilic enolate ion attacks the halogen atom giving us a alpha halo ketone. In this case, since we have taken the example of bromine, we get an alpha bromo ketone. Now the interesting thing is that this alpha bromo ketone is much more acidic than a starting reactant which is the methyl ketone. So I'm going to let you pause the video here and think about why a product which is the alpha bromo ketone is more acidic than a starting methyl ketone, okay? So take a moment, pause the video here. Well, you see, in our alpha bromo ketone, the alpha hydrogens are stuck between two electron withdrawing groups, an electron negative bromine atom and an electron withdrawing CO group, correct? And because of this, the electrons get pulled in both directions and make these hydrogen atoms much more acidic. Here you have only one electron withdrawing CO group, but here the hydrogens are stuck between two electron withdrawing groups. And this is why these hydrogen atoms become much more acidic than the alpha hydrogens of the methyl ketone. So what is the consequence of this? You see, there will be a race. So in our reaction mixture, we have a newly formed alpha bromo ketone, which is much more acidic and reactive than the methyl ketone, which means the alpha bromo ketone would have greater tendency to react with the hydroxyl ion in the reaction mixture as compared to a methyl ketone. So as a result, the hydroxyl ion would immediately abstract the alpha hydrogen atom from the alpha bromo ketone, giving us the corresponding enolate ion. And in the next step, this nucleophilic enolate ion would react with another molecule of bromine, giving us alpha dibromo ketone, a compound which is even more acidic than the alpha bromo ketone itself because now the hydrogen atom is between three electron withdrawing groups. That means it will completely outcompete with the previous ketones to react with the hydroxide ion. And therefore, the OH- would abstract this alpha hydrogen atom and give the corresponding enolate ion. And this enolate ion would finally undergo a third bromination reaction where it abstracts another bromine atom to give us the final product alpha tribromo ketone. You can see from this mechanism that this reaction is really hard to control because the product formed at the end of each deprotonation step is much more acidic than its precursor. And with every successive deprotonation step, we are getting a product which is a stronger acid as compared to its precursor. The reaction continues or the deprotonation continues until we end up with a product which does not have any more acidic alpha hydrogens left. Alright, let's get back to a question. Where is our acid? How do we get our acid from this product which is our alpha tribromo ketone? So in the final step, the hydroxide ion attacks the alpha tribromo ketone. The delocalization of pi electrons take place giving us this tetrahedral intermediate. The C double bond O gets restored here with the elimination of CBr3- ion. And this being a moderately good living group gives us a final product which is a carboxylic acid and CBr3-. Now since the reaction mixture is still predominantly alkaline, the resulting carboxylic acid will be deprotonated by the leaving group CBr3- and this gives us carboxylate salt and haloform, in this case bromoform. Alright, so I haven't color coded it but you get the picture, right? So this is the final haloform reaction. Now remember folks, for all of this to happen, we must have a COCH3 group in our starting carbonyl compound. Only then can we form a trihalomethyl ketone, which on breaking can give us the carboxylate ion and haloform. Any other carbonyl compound which you see might have an alpha hydrogen group cannot give a positive haloform reaction because they do not form a trihalomethyl group and cannot undergo the specific cleavage that is required for this reaction to take place. So it's not just the presence of alpha hydrogens that matter in a starting compound. 
we also need to be able to transform the starting ketone to a compound that has a very good leaving group like CBr3 or CX3. Now this is possible only in the case of methyl ketones. So I hope by the end of this video you have gotten a very good understanding of the mechanism of haloform reaction and why only methyl ketones give this particular reaction.